Okay. Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you guys can hear me better now. I heard there were some technical issues. Um, anyhow guys, welcome back. I hope you were able to catch some of what I was saying. Like I was saying earlier, just to quickly recap, this week the topic is where the heart is, right? So we're taking a look at writing and talking about your home, whether that's here in Vancouver, or back in Japan, back in Korea, back in Colombia, Chile, Mexico, Brazil, etc., etc., right? And we're talking about the order of adjectives. So I want you guys to take a look at the sheet here, order of adjectives. And just remember, I already covered the first paragraph, and I hope you guys were able to hear that, but when you mix up or make a mistake with the order of adjectives, it makes your sentence sound a little bit strange. And this only happens if you're using more than two, like two or more adjectives in a sentence. So it can be kind of rare to encounter this problem, but it does happen. And like I said before, it's not the biggest grammar issue, but we do need to think about it at least a little bit, right? So two things to keep in mind. First, it's very rare to use more than three adjectives before a noun. This doesn't often happen, so you won't often encounter this problem. But also second, sometimes the order can be changed if you really want to emphasize something. But we're going to take a look at the order anyhow. So let's take a look. First one first is opinion. When you are using an adjective of opinion, you are giving your opinion in a sentence with multiple adjectives, this should come first. Whether you're saying something is pretty, something is horrible, something is lovely, something is ugly, or something is, I don't know, uh, beautiful, etc. Your opinion comes first. So we start with opinion first. But moving on further down the list, after opinion, this is where we will say something about the size of something, right? So our examples here are things like, of course, huge, tiny, big, little, etc., right? So first you've got opinion, pretty, ugly, beautiful, etc., etc. Then after that, you've got size, huge, tiny, big, little, small, uh, massive, which also means big, but anyhow, etc. So size is not really a complicated one, right? We know a lot of adjectives for describing size, things like huge, tiny, big, little, small, massive, etc. And yeah, but if you are going to have a sentence where you're talking about, I don't know, uh, a big truck, right? And it's a good looking truck, right? So you want to say, oh, that's a lovely, massive truck, right? I don't know who says that kind of stuff, but opinion comes first, size comes second. Okay, but moving on further down the list, so we've got O for opinion, S for size. When it comes to our order of adjectives, the third thing is age. Now again, age is not too hard to figure out. We've got things like old, young, I think new, elderly, um, I don't know, mm, youngish. I like adding ish to things. You know, if you add ish, if you say youngish, it means like kind of young or oldish, kind of old. Anyhow, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, again, size and age not too hard to talk about. Age, you're just talking about how old this thing is. Is it old? Is it new? Or is this person old? Are they young? Are they elderly? Are they youngish? I don't know, right? Etc. But yeah, let's say, again, you're talking about that truck. It's really good. It's a beautiful truck, but it's a little bit old, right? So you could say, wow, that is a lovely, massive, old truck, right? And there we go. 
So opinion, size, age. Moving on to the fourth one in our order of adjectives, we have shape. Now, shape would be hard for me to use to describe a truck, but uh, shape is pretty easy. Round, square, what else we got here? Triangle, yeah, or triangular, rectangular, etc. So, of course, there are not so many adjectives for describing shape, you know, shape or shapes, right? You've got things like, oh, well, actually, we should include circular. Circular. Now, you guys probably know the nouns for most shapes, and a lot of the nouns have the same spelling as their adjective counterpart, right? Like round, for example, is just round, or square is square. Well, actually, round is an adjective anyhow, but square is a noun, but also the adjective form. Triangle, though, you have to change it to triangular. Rectangle, you have to change to rectangular. Or circle, you must change to circular, right? It's a circular looking cup, etc. So if you're going to be talking about the shape of something, this is going to come forth, right? Now, again, I was describing a truck. If we're describing a truck and including its shape, that's kind of weird. But again, it's a lovely, massive, old, round, tire right let's describe a tire instead okay so opinion size age shape so so far we've got o s a s osis right osas osas right anyhow let's look at our fifth one here fifth on the list we have color of course now keep in mind this is not a big difference, but when Canadians and British people spell the word color, we include a U, but Americans do not because Americans are simplifying the English language because the U is silent. It doesn't really add anything, so they decided to remove it. Anyhow, guys, color, of course, that just means, you know, black, red, yellow, white, blue, orange, you know, whatever color, etc. So nothing complicated about that, right? So we've got opinion, size, age, shape, color, right? So again, if we're talking about a tire, wow, that is a lovely, massive, old, round, black tire, right? And there we go. So O-S-A-S-C, let's move on to our sixth one here. In our sixth spot, we have origin. Hmm. Now, of course, origin means where did it come from? Where is it from? Like what country, what region, right? So the examples they have here are origins like British or Chinese, French, Japanese. Italian, but you could also have like regional areas within a country, right? Northern, Southern, Eastern, Western, something like that, right? So etc. All right, guys. So if you want to talk about where this thing is, but you have a lot of adjectives before that, yeah, you need to include these adjectives first and then you come to origin. So Again, let's say we are describing a tire, right? I know that's not a very exciting noun, but anyhow, so you can say that is a beautiful, huge, old, round, black, Chinese tire. Wow, so this tire is from China. It's black. Obviously, it's round. I don't, I've never seen a square tire, uh, but it's old, an old tire, but it's huge. And for some reason, it is lovely or beautiful. I don't know what a beautiful tire is, but you know, they could exist. Anyhow, so sixth in line, we have origin. So, so far we've got O-S-A-S-C-O. -S so, O-S-S-C-O. And then we've got our seventh one. And our seventh one here is material. So, what is this thing 
made of, right? So for material, we have things like woolen, you know, made of wool, sheep's wool. Wooden, made of wood. Silk, obviously just made of silk. Maybe we could have cotton or polyester. And yeah, um, things like that, etc. So if you want to talk about the actual material of the item, this is going to come in seventh place when describing it. And lastly, in our eighth spot, we have purpose. Now, of course, purpose is basically any adjective that is used to describe what is this thing used for, in what certain way, right? So we have like, for example, writing, as in the case of paper, right? Or school can be used as an adjective to describe something that you use in the school, like school shoes, right? Or uh, also you can use computer as an adjective to describe the purpose of something. The purpose of something as an adjective is not going to pop up too much when you're using multiple adjectives, but it can, right? Now again, it would be really, really, really hard for me to think of an example that uses all eight of these different adjectives in an order, right? But, hmm, yeah, no, I can't think of an example off the top of my head. Like I said before, it's pretty uncommon to make a sentence that includes three or more adjectives, but if you are going to do that, you want to keep the order of adjectives in mind. And this is supposed to be kind of a helpful way to help you guys understand the correct order, but it says here, the first letter of these words spell OSESCOMP. O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P. So this part sounds like computer and osis sounds like, well, I don't know, osis sounds like osis or oasis or something, right? But yeah, maybe you wanna, this might be helpful for you guys if you're kind of confused later about the order of adjectives. Osis comp, osis comp, right? O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P. Opinion, size, age, shape, color, origin, material, and purpose, right? Anyhow, and it says this was pointed out by the fabulous Mignon Fogarty, um, who is a famous guy. Anyhow, thinking about the words osis comp is a great way to remember the order of adjectives. So if you're ever stuck, maybe you're writing something and you, you're using multiple adjectives and you're thinking like, oh my god, I can't remember what is the correct order of adjectives. Try to remember osis comp. OSS comp and like try to remember what do those stand for? Opinion, size, age, shape, color, origin, material, and purpose, right? Now it says below here determiners and then determiners are words like you know a, uh, un, some, several. Of course they go at the beginning and then your adjectives come into play and lastly, whatever that noun is that you are describing using the adjectives. We can also put adverbs like really and very at the beginning, though after the, the determiner. So if you wanted to say, you wanted to use very, right, that would come first before the adjectives, right? So again, that is a very lovely, massive, old round black Chinese rubber school tire. Bleh, right? That sounds really weird though, but anyhow, that would be an example. Now, we have some more examples here on the very bottom of the page, guys. So, we've gone over the order of adjectives. I gave you guys a few extra examples. Of course, there are examples on the sheet here. Let me erase the board and let's look at some examples and maybe I will try to provide a few more. So, give me a second. And just remember, when you're in doubt, just keep in mind OSASCOMP. O S A S C O M P. So 
opinion and size. And age, shape, color, origin, material, purpose. Anyhow, all right, guys, so here are some examples. This person said, I carried a very small black suitcase. So let's think of this example here. I carried a very small black suitcase. Okay, so let's identify the words in this sentence here. Of course, we have our subject, I. And then we have carried, which of course is our verb. Now, after that, at the very end of the sentence, we have our noun, right? Which we are describing, this suitcase. Now, ah, uh, what is ah? Uh, ah uh is our determiner, or basically our article, right? Very, this is our adverb, right? And then we've got small black. So actually, we have just two adjectives in the sentence, but they are in the correct order. So let's think about them. So small, Small is describing what? Is it describing opinion? Is it describing material? Is it describing origin? What is it, right? Of course, small is talking about size, right? And then we have black, which is the color. So black is talking about color. And that's why we know in the order of adjectives, size comes second and color comes fifth. And that's why in this sentence here, small comes first, color or black comes second, because size comes before color, right? And there we go. Okay, let's take a look at another example in some detail. We have, ah, okay. They have some, what do they have some of? They have some old French paintings. Well, congratulations to these people. Maybe they are rich. Okay. So, of course, they, again, this is our subject. They have, that's our verb. The noun that we are describing, of course, is the, or are the paintings here. Wait, what am I doing? Do, 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 do. Now, now, some is our determiner. And in this sentence here, we do not have an adverb, right? But again, we have two adjectives. We've got old and we've got French. And basically, I think you don't need to include old when you're talking about French things because most French things are old and also kind of smelly. Just a joke. I'm sorry if you're French. Anyhow, so old and French. All right, so old. Where does that come when it comes to the order of adjectives? Old is what? Is that an opinion? Is it the size? No and no. It's talking about the age, right? So old is talking about age, right? And then we have French, right? What is French talking about? That's not talking about the size or your opinion or the material or something like that. That is talking about origin, right? Where this thing comes from. It comes from France. That's its origin. Now, we have to keep in mind, according to Osses Comp, right, when we talk about age, that comes in third place. When we talk about origin, that comes in sixth place. And therefore, age must come before origin. So old comes first, French comes afterwards. Bada bing, bada boom, we're done, right? old French paintings. Okay, let's take a look at another example in a little bit more detail. We have, she was wearing, what was she wearing? A new red silk dress. Oh, la ti da, right? Sounds like a nice dress. 
All right, so thinking about the sentence here, we've got our subject with she, and we've got the be verb, so there's our verb, and we have this in the present continuous tense, so there we have our verb plus ing. Not terribly important because we're focusing on adjectives, but the dress, of course, is what we are describing. That is our noun. A, of course, is our determiner, right, or our article. And then we have three adjectives here. New, red, and silk. Boom, boom, and boom. So let's talk about these adjectives and why they are in this order. So thinking about new, new is talking about the age of something, right? Thinking about red, of course, red is talking about the color. And thinking about silk, we are talking about the material of this dress. Now, we have to keep in mind, OSASCOMP, O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P, right? New is our first one, and it's talking about age, right? So remember, age comes in third, OSAS, right, COMP. Red, our color, color comes in fifth, right? And then silk, talking about the material, that comes in seventh. And that's why they have ordered the sentence like they have here, right? Because we've got age, color, material. Age, third, color, fifth, material, seventh, right? So again, she was wearing a new red silk dress, and there we go. Now, this is an example of using three adjectives. Previously, we were just taking a look at two. But yeah, good stuff. Okay, now moving on further, let me erase the board, guys, because we'll look at a few more examples here. Okay, so let's take a look at the next three. That is a really ugly wooden chair. Okay, that is a really ugly wooden chair. Okay, and let's go over, let's look at this in a little bit less detail, otherwise it just takes me too long, right? But of course, ah, uh, we've got our determiner, determiner. Then we've got really, and really, of course, is not an adjective. This is our adverb. And then we've got boom, boom, our two adjectives, and of course, our noun is chair. So let's think about our two adjectives here, though. So our two adjectives are ugly and wooden. So what kind of adjective is ugly? Is that about the size? Is it about the age? Is it about the color? Is it the origin, the material, the purpose? No, 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 no. Ugly is an opinion, right? And opinions always come first, and that's why ugly is first in this order of adjectives here. And wooden, of course, means that the material of the chair is made out of wood, and so wooden is a material and that's why, or well, wooden is in seventh, but that is basically why this is in the order that it is, is because ugly is an opinion, wooden is a material, this always comes first, material comes seventh, but we don't have anything else in between, so ugly wooden chair. Okay, so that one's pretty simple. Looking at another example here, we bought, what did they buy? We bought a new round kitchen table. Okay, this is a good example. So we've got three adjectives. So table, of course, is a noun that we are describing. Ah, of course, too easy. This is our determiner. And then our three adjectives, new, round, kitchen. Boom, boom, boom. So let's think about these adjectives here. So new is talking about the age. Round is talking about the shape. 
and kitchen. Kitchen, of course kitchen is usually used as a noun, right? But it can be used as an adjective as well, right? Describing something that comes or is often used in the kitchen, right? So kitchen is our purpose. So of course new, when it comes to age, age comes in third, right? Round, when we're talking about shape, shape comes in fourth. And lastly, when we're talking about the purpose of this thing, this thing is used in the kitchen, that comes in actually last place, in eighth. And that's why, again, this, these adjectives in this sentence, they come in this order like they do. New round kitchen, third, fourth, eighth table. A new round kitchen table. Hmm. And good for them, they got a new one. OK, guys, last sentence we're going to take a look at here. Well, actually, maybe not last one, but the last one on the sheet here says there are some new Chinese students in the class. Okay, so this sentence, a little bit more complicated, right? But some is our determiner or our article. And then, what is the noun that we're describing? In this case, actually, it's not the class. The noun that we're describing are the people, right? Which are the students. And our t we just have two adjectives here. And that those are new and Chinese. So, let's think of our adjectives here. So, we've got new, which is talking about the age. And then we have Chinese, which of course is talking about the origin. And of course, we know when we are talking about age, age comes in third. Origin comes in later, around sixth place, and that's why it is new Chinese students, right? And there we go. Okay, guys. Now, I know this is, how can I say, it? this is a mix of being both easy and hard. Uh, like I said before, if you do make a mistake with the order of adjectives, nobody's going to kill you, right? It's not a huge, huge deal, right? However, it will make the sentence sound a little bit funny. So it is kind of good to try to keep in mind OSAS comp, O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P, opinion and size and then all the other stuff, right? OK, so let me erase this here. Let me write down one of my own examples, and then we'll identify the adjectives in my example. So I'm going to think about one of my neighbors in the past. I didn't really like this neighbor very much. We didn't have a good relationship. Um, yeah, so I'm going to describe my neighbor. My neighbor had a nasty, actually I'm going to mix this up actually. He had a old, mm, old French nasty. The tiny head. And actually, I shouldn't put commas here. So, my neighbor had an old French nasty tiny head, right? Okay, kind of a silly sentence, but anyhow, this is not exactly true. Um, I didn't like my neighbor very much, but he wasn't actually French. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, so anyhow, guys, we're talking about my neighbor, right? So that is the subject, my neighbor had. Of course, this is our verb, right? And our noun that we are describing here is my neighbor's head, right? And A, of course, this is our article or determiner or article. And we have one, two, three, four adjectives. One, two, three, four. Let's think of these adjectives, right? Now you might be thinking when you read this, my neighbor had an old French nasty tiny head. Sounds a little bit weird, doesn't it? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Let's take a look here 
at these adjectives. Okay, so first things first, old, of course, we're talking about age. French, of course, we are talking about origin. Nasty, now nasty can have, you know, kind of two different meanings as an adjective. Um, it can describe somebody's behavior in that they're kind of mean or awful, something like that, or nasty in a physical sense can mean something is kind of ugly, right? And then also like a, as in behavior, like ugly behavior, right? But anyhow, um, so nasty actually would be my opinion. So opinion and then tiny, of course, it's talking about size. So thinking about OSASCOMP, O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P, is the order of adjectives here correct? No, it is not. So let's think about this. Old is age. Age comes in third, right? French is origin. Origin comes in sixth. So, so far that's looking okay. But nasty, nasty is an opinion. An opinion comes in first. And then tiny is describing the size. Tiny comes in second. So the order here, a old French nasty tiny head is incorrect. This is not right. We need to correct this order. So let's erase this and put it in the correct order. So our first one here is going to be nasty because that is an opinion. A nasty and then after that tiny because size is coming in second. A nasty tiny and then in third we have age old and lastly origin because it's in sixth place French head. <laughs> it's still a weird sentence though. My neighbor had a nasty tiny old French head. Um, okay again just an example is not true um, although my neighbor was a nasty guy I don't think he was actually French but um, he did have a nasty tiny old head. Mm. All right guys so two things to keep in mind here it's uncommon to use two, well, two adjectives in a sentence is not really uncommon, but three or more adjectives in a sentence is uncommon. Uh, and if you are going to use three adjectives or more in a sentence, try to keep OSAS comp in mind. However, also keep in mind not to stress out about this so much because this is not something that a lot of English speakers are really that concerned about. And this is something that English speakers do make mistakes when we are making our own sentences. Like I said before, this is not something we study when we study our own language in English, right? Um, but yeah, it's useful to keep it in mind, but it's not something that you want to put a lot of pressure on yourself about, right? Now, besides that one sheet and looking at the examples, guys, we also have this kind of infographic a uh, piece of paper here it says perfect English grammar and we've got a bunch of circles looks like a big web in the order uh, in the middle it has the order of adjectives and it's got the shorthand version for you OSAS comp O S A S C O M P and it has some more examples so you can see it expands to number one opinion great horrible fantastic two size big tiny enormous right Three, age, young, old, new. Four, shape, round, square, triangular. Fifth, color, red, green, black, etc. Sixth, origin, British, French, American, Japanese, Korean, Chilean, etc. Seventh, material. Unfortunately, that's kind of cut off, but you know, wooden, silk, plastic, stone, brick, etc. And eight, purpose, writing, desk school, shoes, sleeping bag, right? So I would recommend throughout this week when you are, especially when you're doing your writing, maybe keep this one around you to remind you of the correct order of adjectives, right? This could help you out 
especially when you're doing your writing. Okay, all right guys, but that's about it for today's grammar. You guys will be looking at the grammar in a bit more detail as the week continues and progresses. And of course, we will be doing a review of this grammar on Friday before you take your quiz, uh, whether that's the written quiz or the speaking quiz, right? So anyhow, in our second class today, of course, we are gonna be going over some vocabulary and idioms. There's actually way too much vocabulary this week. So I think what we're gonna do, guys, is we're gonna focus on the idioms because the vocabulary isn't really that hard. It's just something that, unfortunately, you're gonna have to study mostly by yourself. But just to get ready for the second class, guys, I'd like you guys to be able to refer to these two sheets here. The first one is 20 idioms about the house and home, right? And when it comes to these 20 idioms, we're not gonna go over every single idiom in extreme detail. If I don't think it's very useful, we will skip it, right? But also this sheet here, it says English idioms, home, right? And we'll look at some of these. There might be a little bit of mixture here, but we'll see how it goes. So yeah, we'll look at the idioms. If we have extra time, we may go
Okay, okay, okay. Like inside or? Uh, let me. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Hey guys, welcome back to Live PST. I am Alan, as you already know, and you guys know in the first class, of course, we went over some grammar. We looked at the order of adjectives, os, has, com. But in our second class today, we need to take a look at some vocabulary. Now, I know guys that there are actually so many different sheets you guys can look at here for vocab, right? We have houses and furniture, so different parts of the house and the furniture you can find in them, in the kitchen, the dining room, kitchen appliances, um, the living room, what else do we have here? More living room, in the bedroom, parts of a house, which is probably the most useful one so far, um, tables, and we also have yeah, different parts of the house, etc., etc. There's too much stuff here for us to go over, right? So like I said before the break started, we're going to start with idioms first and see how this goes, right? And so I want you guys to look at the sheet that says 20 idioms about the house and home. Okay, so let's take a look at this here. Let's look at the definition or the meaning of the idiom and then also try to think of an example sentence, right? But if we come to an idiom that I don't think is useful, I'm just going to skip it because if I don't use it, other English speakers probably don't use it and it's kind of useless. So let's take a look at number one. Mm, okay, number one to get started with is a home truth. Sorry guys, but I don't use this expression. I don't use this idiom. So right off the bat, we already have a useless idiom. So please strike out number one. It is no good. Let's take a look at number two though. Number two actually is okay. A house divided cannot stand. And I actually really like this expression. This expression or this idiom comes from Abraham Lincoln, um, one of the American or most famous American presidents during the Civil War in the United States. And the reason why he used this expression is because at the time that hate each other cannot stand, it cannot stay alive basically. So the definition here is an organization that is divided by internal disagreements will not be able to cope with external pressures. Oh my God, that is a really hard explanation, right? But it basically means an organization where there are two separate groups that really hate each other cannot work. It just doesn't work. Um, so actually it's hard to think of a good example here, but um, a good example would be the United States right now, honestly. Uh, but let, let me think of a Canadian example. Let's say the Canadian Liberal Party and Conservative Party hate each other. A house divided cannot stand. So usually this expression is in a sentence of its own, right? A house divided cannot stand, but you need to provide context or an explanation why, you know, these two things are separated, right? Anyhow guys, number two is good. I like it, but it is very hard to use, right? So let's move on to number three, home away from home. This is a good expression, home away from home. A home away from home 
is somewhere where you feel really comfortable, like you would feel in your own home, right? You know, in your home, whether that's in Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, China, Thailand, you know, whatever, wherever you are, Korea, Japan, you feel very comfortable in your own home. But if you find another place where you feel really comfortable, you can describe that place as your home away from home, like your second home is a place where you always feel comfortable, right? Now, I've traveled a fair amount, right? And I lived in Seoul and I really enjoyed my time in Seoul. At first, I didn't feel really comfortable, of course, you know, it's not my home country, it's not my hometown. But after some time, I got really used to the food in Korea, the transportation system, the movies, I had lots of friends. So I felt really comfortable when I lived in Seoul. So I can say for me, let's see here, for me, Seoul is my home away from home. Basically, I'm just saying Seoul is like my second home. It's a place where I feel comfortable, right? So home away from home, good expression. It's not like we use this a lot, but it is a good one, right? It's just describing a place where you feel so comfortable, right? So let's take a look at number four, home comforts. Hmm, sorry guys, let's skip number four. I don't use the expression home comforts, but I do use the expression number five, which is, you know, the idiom that's used for this week's topic. Home is where the heart is. Home is where the heart is. Home is where the heart is. That just means a home is not really a physical place. It's a place where the people you love are, right? So sometimes my wife and I say this, of course we have a home, we're renting an apartment, but we don't really love our place so much, right? And if my wife, you know, had to go somewhere else, I would say, hey, you know, home is where the heart is. I want to be with you, right? Uh, my home is wherever my wife and children are, right? It's not an actual physical place. It's a place where I can be with my wife and kids, right? So home is where the heart is. Um, it's hard to think of a good example here, but maybe somebody might say, I miss my siblings and parents. You know, home is where the heart is, right? Like if you guys, like Gian or Alejandro, you know, or whoever, you know, for you guys, home is probably where your loved ones are too, with your mom and your dad, your siblings, your brothers and sisters, and you probably feel the same way. You want to be around them, or if you're in a long-term relationship or married, you want to be with your husband or wife, and that's where the home is for you guys too. Anyhow, let's move on to number six. Number six is actually a good expression. Somebody might say, hey, it's on the house. And you might think, oh, so that means it's on the house. It's physically on top of the house. No, it actually has a different meaning. If somebody says it's on the house, it means this is free, right? This is maybe a present at the manager's expense, right? This is usually used really only in a restaurant or a bar. Like if a waiter gives you a beer for free, you're like, oh, hey, do I have to pay for this? And they might say, no it's on the house. Basically, they're just saying, it's for free. So basically, on the house is very easy to understand. It just means something is free, right? So maybe a good example here, somebody says, hey, here's, here is a beer. Also, don't worry about it, it is on the house. 
the management, the bar, the restaurant, the establishment is paying the fee, right? So it's free for you. Awesome. It's on the house. So anytime maybe you want to give something to your friend, like you're in a bar, you're in a restaurant, you want to order some food for your friend, you don't want your friend to pay, or you want to order a drink for your friend, you don't want your, your friend to pay for the drink. You just, hey, it's on the house, right? Don't worry about it. That beer is on the house. Enjoy, right? Okay, anyhow guys, so that's number six. That's a good one. Um, seven, safe as houses, no. I've never used this expression before. Skip that one. Number eight is close to home. And this expression is used, or at least I use it. Close to home. Now, of course, this could just mean something is close to your house or close to your home, right? But close to home means nearing an embarrassing or uncomfortable truth, usually used to describe a remark. So, this is hard to explain, but if something is close to home for you, if something that you heard or you saw that you have experienced in your life, and so when you see that thing or you hear that thing, it has a big emotional impact on you because you've had a similar experience, right? So, hmm, what would be a good, okay, okay, I actually have an example, like, of course, two, two years ago and two and a half years ago, my wife and I gave birth to our first daughter and, you know, recently we had another child, right? Now, if I read news about children who get sick or die or children who are kidnapped, for me now, that hits close to home uh, because I have kids now. So when I see these news stories about kids that have been hurt, injured, or killed, um, because I have my own kids, it makes me think of my kids and it makes me think of something awful happening to them and it kind of has a big emotional impact on me. In the past, when I didn't have kids, of course, I still felt bad when I read those stories, but I couldn't really identify with them, but now I can because I have kids. So I could say, for example, you know, ever since, whoops, my kids, were born, I can't read bad news stories about kids because it hits close to home. So usually when we're using an expression close to home, we use the verb hits. Like it hits you, like an emotional impact, an emotional punch, right? Um, so this could happen to you guys too. Maybe you watch a movie about something that you've experienced. Something, usually it's something bad, right? Well, actually it's always something bad. And you watch this movie and you've had a, a similar terrible experience in your life and you're like, man, this movie hits close to home, right? is having an emotional impact on me. So anyhow, good expression, but it's only used in a very negative way. So let's move on, guys. Let me erase the board here so far. Okay, so moving on guys, um, number nine, to bring something home to someone, um, to force someone to realize and accept the, hmm, I'm sorry guys, number nine, I also don't use this expression, so please skip. To drive something home though, number 10, I do use this expression, to drive something home to, oh no, not to someone, but anyhow, to drive something home. To drive something home means to insist or maybe to repeat a point until it is clearly understood. 
So my example here would be sometimes teachers repeat what they have said in order to drive it home. So what I'm saying here is teachers repeat maybe some rules of the classroom or some grammar point because they want to drive that home. They want students to understand that this is really, really, really important, right? And they want them to clearly understand this point. So today, you know, we talked about OSAS comp in the order of adjectives, right? Maybe I should just keep repeating that. O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P, O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P, O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P. I want to drive this home. I want you to remember this clearly, right? OSAS comp. Anyhow, so that's number 10, guys. Let's move on to number 11, to eat someone out of house and home. Yeah, that's not bad, actually. Um, to eat someone out of house, oops, that looks weird, house and home. Basically, that just means to eat a lot of food. That means you have been maybe invited to somebody's house and you've eaten so much food in their house that you are making them go bankrupt, right? You are making them poor because you ate all of their food. You're eating them out of house and home, right? This kind of means like, you know, if you're eating someone out of house and home, like you're being a pig, you're being too greedy. Stop eating so much, right? Um, like my parents, for example, my parents always, actually not my mom actually, but mostly just my dad, but my parents always told my siblings and I that we were eating them out of house and home. So my parents used to tell us, especially my father, like, oh my God, you're eating me out of house and home. Like, you're eating so much food that you are making me poor, right? You are bankrupting me. Stop eating so much, right? Or let's say my friend and I, we are invited to somebody's house party. A good friend of ours has, you know, come up with a house party and they've invited us, invited us out over, right? And so my friend and I, we go to this party and my friend is just being a big, big pig, right? Like maybe he didn't eat dinner. So he's eating way too much, drinking way too much. And I say, hey, whoa, 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 John. Johnny, stop it. You're eating them out of house and home. Like you're eating all their food. You're, you're gonna make them poor. What are you doing, right? So anyhow, that is the meaning of to eat someone out of house and home. The way I would use it is just, you know, to emphasize to somebody that they're being too greedy. They're eating too much. You're like, whoa, 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 stop. You're eating this person, or you're eating me out of house and home. Stop eating so much. Anyhow, that's number 11, guys. Let's move on to number 12. Ah, 12 is too easy and very commonly used. To feel homesick. All right, what does that mean, to feel homesick? Of course, that just means that you miss home, right? So I know a lot of international students, all international students, right? no matter what country you're studying in, at some point you will feel homesick, right? You will miss your home, right? Now that could mean you miss your parents and siblings, but it could also mean it, you miss your mom's cooking, you miss your room, you miss the climate in your hometown, you miss the environment, you miss the animals. You know, it could just mean you miss anything from like your hometown and your family, right? And that's what saying I feel homesick means, right? Um, you know, a quick example, um, I could say when I was living abroad, do, 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 sometimes I 
felt homesick. Yeah, pretty simple. Yeah, you just, you know, you miss home, right? You miss your family, you miss the food, you miss maybe the environment. Um, like when I lived in Korea for the first while when I was there, this will sound really, really weird. The first time I got homesick in Korea was after maybe six weeks uh, when I arrived in Korea. It had not rained. And my hometown is one of the rainiest places in Canada. It's in the top five. And also probably one of the rainiest places in the world. So I grew up in an environment and climate where we get a lot of rain. And so I kind of like rain, right? And anyhow, it didn't rain for a long time when I was in Korea for about six weeks and I was starting to feel oddly homesick, right? I was thinking like, oh my God, when is it gonna rain? When does it rain in this country? Like, this is ridiculous. It's just, there's no rain, right? So the first time it rained, I was so happy actually. And I remember I had a plan to go meet my friend, I think at a subway station or something like that. So in my hometown, of course, we don't use umbrellas that's seen as feminine for whatever reason. So when I went to go meet my friend, I didn't have an umbrella and the rain's just falling on my head and I was kind of happy. And then I met my friend and he's like, hey, where's your umbrella or where's your hood? And I was like, oh, I don't need one. I'm used to rain. He's like, no, 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 you idiot. This is acid rain. Your hair is going to go white or you might lose your hair. And I was like, oh, my God. So I started using umbrella. But yeah. At a time, I felt a little bit homesick because I kind of missed the climate or the environment of my hometown. But like most people, you know, homesickness is just a temporary thing. It goes away. And then after that, maybe you still miss your hometown or maybe things are just kind of normal for you. Or maybe you even like the country you're in even more than your home country. But let's move on to number 13 to get on like a house on fire. Mm, sorry, I've never used this expression before. 13, no. Um, hmm. 14, oh my God, sorry, 14 as well. I don't use that expression. So let's take a look at 15, to go all around the houses. Um, this is not a bad expression. It's not complicated. To go round or to go all around the houses. The meaning of this is just to take an indirect roundabout route to your destination. Like maybe you're at point A, you need to go to point B. You could just go in a straight line, but you decide not to. You decide to go all around the houses. You decide to go around here and then you go to point B, right? So it just means to go somewhere in an indirect way, not directly, right? Um, so the example you could just say here is, I walked home and went all around the houses. Or you could say something like, I went all around the houses on my way home. Okay. All right, guys. So that's 15. Not a tricky one. Ah, um, number 16 is not bad to hit home. To hit home. I hit home. All right. Um, to hit home just means to hit or to reach a target. Like you got it. Well done, right? Um, you hit home. Okay, so pretty simple that one. Um, the home in on. Also, I do use this one. To home in on. To home in on means like to get closer to a target that maybe you want to achieve. Actually, this expression is kind of like a military expression. And the meaning of this is like when they shoot a missile 
or maybe a torpedo. And that missile is going to get closer and closer and closer to the object that it is trying to hit and blow up, right? So if they shoot a missile at a jet plane, the missile is going to try to follow the jet plane and then hit it. And as it's getting closer, they would say, the missile is homing in on the jet plane or on the jet fighter or whatever, right? But you don't have to use this yourself in a military sense, right? This just means you are getting closer to accomplishing something, right? Let's say you are saving up money in order to buy a new car. You could say, I am, and you could use the present continuous sense here. Uh, I'm homing in on doing something. I'm homing in on buying a new car. So you're getting close to having enough money in order to purchase that new car, right? You're like, yeah, I'm homing in on buying a new car. Soon I'll have enough money to buy that, you know, Toyota or Hyundai or Nissan or, you know, Ford Explorer or whatever it is, right? I'm homing in on buying a new car. All right, guys, so we've got these ones done. Let me erase this here. We've got just two, no, three more ones to take a look at here, and then we can look at the next sheet. I know this is a lot of stuff though, right? And please guys, if I skipped one of the idioms, please keep in mind that it's kind of useless, or it's not used in Canadian and American English, so don't use it yourselves, right? Please ignore it. So let's take a look at number 18. Is this useful to keep house? Hmm, to keep house is not bad, but it's not terribly good either. But let's take a look here. So to keep house. To keep house basically means to carry out the tasks necessary for running a household, cooking, cleaning, throwing out garbage, uh, plunging the toilets, doing the laundry, etc., etc., etc. To keep house basically means to, to be a housekeeper, to be the person who does most of the work in the home, right? Now, these days, let's think of a modern example, right? These days, both men and women keep house, right? Both men and women, you know, share duties and clean the house together. However, you could say, however, traditionally, women were the ones who kept house. So we know in the past it was mostly women that did all the cleaning, cooking, laundry, etc., etc. But nowadays, of course, in most countries, men and women share the duties. I still think in general, women do a little bit more housework than men. I think it's like 40, 60. Men do 40, women do 60. But it depends on everybody's situation, right? There are some guys who are like uh, house husbands, right? Or like home husbands that stay home and take care of the kids and clean things and the wife goes and works. But that's uncommon. Anyhow, 19 guys, to make yourself at home is just a nice, expression to say to someone, to make yourself at home. The meaning of this means, please make yourself comfortable like you were at home, right? So when you invite a guest into your house, right, into your home, you say to this guest, hey, make yourself at home, right? Please treat my house like it is your house. Please be comfortable. Use the bathroom if you want. Please sit down on the couch. Hey, get a drink, get some food. It's okay. Make yourself at home. So usually when we use this, um, it's just in a sentence by itself most likely, but maybe you're saying to somebody, you're like, hey, welcome to our home. Please make yourself at home by 
like, please make yourself feel comfortable. Please make yourself feel like you're in your own home, right? And that's it. Okay, so number 20, guys. Um, to play house. Okay, well, to play house is something that children generally do. But maybe when you're in a long-term relationship with, you know, your girlfriend or boyfriend, maybe sometimes you guys like to play house and pretend that you are married or that you have a family, right? Like kind of for fun. I don't know who does that for fun because in reality it's pretty hard. Uh, but yeah, to play house is just to pretend to be a family. Usually said of children playing, but yeah, it could be older people. So for an example, maybe somebody says, when I was a kid, and maybe this is a woman, I used to play house with my friends, right? And sometimes my daughter likes to pretend, you know, she's two and a half, but she likes to pretend to like cook food or organize something or fold laundry. So sometimes I think she's like playing house, right? Okay, it's good. So that was from the first big list of idioms we had. All the ones I skipped here, please don't look at them. They're kind of use, useless, but the ones I did go over are pretty good. Now, we also have that other sheet here that doesn't include too many idioms, but the ones it does are pretty good. So please take a look at English idioms colon home, right? We just have four of them here, five. Ah, now some of these, like I said before, there would be some overlap. Some of these we already went over, but the next one, the first one here, we didn't go over and it says, there's no place like home. If you say there is no place like home, the meaning of that is like home is a special place for you or whoever it is, right? Um, so a lot of people say like, hey, I had a really good time on my vacation, but there is no place like home. Like my home is a special place to me. And the home doesn't just include the physical structure of the house. It might include the neighborhood or the city, right? Um, so an example here is, you know, maybe I say my vacation, which of course nobody really has a vacation these days, but my vacation to uh, Las Vegas was awesome, but I missed Vancouver and my family. And then I just say, there is no place like home. You know, like I had a really good time in this place. It was awesome, but really there's no place like home, right? Uh, because I like my city and I like my family, of course, right? Okay, so yeah, if you say there's no place like home, you're just saying, you know, home is a special place for you and it's really awesome. All right, next one we have here is one we already encountered, make yourself at home. So actually that just goes to show you that make yourself at home is a very commonly used expression and idiom, right? If you do use make yourself at home, just means, hey, make yourself comfortable in my home. Treat my home like it's your home. Um, the next one we have here is home and dry. Hmm, have successfully completed something as a project or activity. I just need one more source for this essay and then I'll be home and dry. Okay, yeah, this expression is used to be home and dry. So yeah, it says here, sorry, I'm switching markers as well. The black was starting to die. Um, it just means you have successfully completed something or maybe you're close to successfully completing something. So somebody might say, yeah, I'm almost done my project. I will soon be home and dry. Home and dry, like I'll soon be finished this thing successfully, right? 
I'm almost done my project. I will soon be home and dry. Awesome. Okay, so that is a good expression, but let me erase the board, guys, because it's starting to get kind of messy and kind of confusing here. We only have two more to look at anyhow, but do, 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 do. <laughs> Okay, so um, just two more here. Ah, now actually these two other ones, sorry guys, we've already covered them previously, but again, it's good to do a quick reminder because these ones are useful to home in on, right? Re remember, to home in on just means you're getting closer and closer to accomplishing whatever you set out to do, or you're getting closer to your target, right? Boom. If you want to, let's say you just started studying English, and right now, your target is just achieving an intermediate level. If you said, for example, I'm homing in on being able to speak English at an intermediate level, this means you're getting closer and closer. It doesn't mean you're there yet, but it means you are getting closer. You're moving in the right direction. Okay, so to home in on and close to home. And remember, just close to home, if something hits you, Close to home, it just means something affects you in a strong and personal way. As a teacher, their comments hit close to home. So somebody said something that affected this teacher in an emotional way, right? The comments made a lot of sense for that teacher. So maybe the teacher was upset. Like, let's say, for example, uh, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, let's say, for example, when you were a kid, you were kind of a fat kid, right? You ate too much food, you ate too much cake, you, you got kind of fat, right? And when you were younger, when you were a kid, you always felt very self-conscious about it. You felt kind of bad, right? And when you're walking to work or you're walking outside, you see some kids making fun of some fat kid. And they're like, hey, fat kid, hey, piggy, piggy, oink, 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 you look like a pig eating too much cake. <laughs> um, and then you hear these comments and it kind of reminds you of when you were younger and you were fat and it makes you sad, right? You say, wow, those comments really hit close to home for me, right? It made me feel upset. Okay, but we're going to stop it there with all of the idioms and expressions. Now, I'd just like to remind you guys though, that in addition to these idioms and expressions, there's so much vocabulary that has been included in this week's material, right? So when you have time later, it is a good idea to cover all of this stuff here. Um, some of it, the only one that's really maybe, like it's not difficult stuff, you get a visual example. Um, I'm sure you guys don't know all of these, so it is a good idea to review this stuff. I think the only one that's like a little bit hard would be maybe parts of the house and maybe the types of houses. So maybe let's just take a quick look at types of houses. So that'll be the one that says at the top left, houses and furniture, basic level one, but it's not that basic really. Um, so it has, the list of types of houses. So first we have things like a bungalow. And a bungalow is a house, but it is a house with only one story or one floor. That is what we call a bungalow, right? And then, okay, now this is British. So actually we don't say caravan in Canada and America. Actually we say trailer. A trailer is a kind of house, but it is a wheeled vehicle for living or traveling in. So if you want to travel around the country and live in this place, we would call it a caravan or a trailer, but we don't, a trailer can be taken somewhere else or it could just be, you know, in a fixed location. Um, trailers don't really have a good reputation. Generally speaking in Canada and America, if somebody lives in a trailer park, they are usually considered to be kind of poor because trailers 
are quite cheap, right? Um, so that is a caravan or trailer. Now, after that, guys, we have the term cottage. A cottage is a small house in the country or a village. So usually a cottage is a nice looking small house in the countryside, right? Try to imagine the, how could I say? Try to imagine the movie Lord of the Rings, right? Now, if you saw Lord of the Rings, which is an awesome movie, if you have not seen Lord of the Rings, you really should watch it because it's amazing. Um, Frodo and Sam and, whoa, I can't remember the other names of the hobbits. Frodo and Sam and the other ones, they are hobbits, so it's like little people and they live in the Shire, which is a small little village and they have these nice little homes kind of built into the side of a hill and some of them have little cottages, these nice little houses, right? And they're so cute. That's what cottages kind of are. I wish I had a cottage in the countryside. Anyhow, guys, after this we have detached house. Now, a detached house is what we think of when we just think of a regular house. A detached house is just a house by itself. It is not attached to another house or another structure. It is just by itself, probably in the suburbs or in the countryside, is less likely to see houses in a big city, right? Houses are more likely to be in a suburban area or in a rural area. And then after that, we have flat or apartment. British people use the term flat to describe an apartment, but Canadians and Americans, we don't use the term flat. We just say apartment, right? And an apartment is just a set of rooms within a building, right? On a certain floor. So I'm sure you guys already know what an apartment is. Many of us here in Vancouver, of course, we usually live in apartments or we rent an apartment, etc. Next term we have is semi-detached house. A semi-detached house is a house, but it is connected to another house, right? And we might refer to a semi-detached house actually in a different way. Um, we probably call it a townhouse. Semi-detached house is usually referred to as a townhouse in Canada, America. And that's like when you see, okay, I'm very bad at drawing, but you see, I don't know, maybe four houses and they're kind of connected to each other. That is a townhouse, right? Okay, that is a terrible drawing. Please ignore that. But a townhouse is a house attached to another house. And then we have the last one here, a terraced house joined to several houses to form a row. Um, basically, that has the same meaning as this one here. Um, I think that's just a British term. We never really use the term terraced house. I prefer you guys just use townhouse. Okay. Now, within a house, there are many different rooms. Um, and you guys can see the infographic here. So you can see at the very top, there's an attic where people usually keep old things, kind of used as a storage room. There's also the balcony, which could also be used instead. Well, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. A balcony is outside portion, not to be confused with a patio. Yeah, basement, a cellar, bathroom, bedroom, etc., etc., etc. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here. Please take a look at that when you got time. And then they have different sections here in the garden, in the kitchen, in this area, in that area. All right. So honestly, I think for the rest of this here, guys, it's probably be best for you guys just to take a look at these images. Not every certain item here is really that useful. Um, yeah, I also do recommend, though, taking a look at the parts of a house. Um, yeah, ridge, roof, chimney, chimney pot, <laughs> yeah, chimney. Uh, chimneys are not very common anymore, but anyhow. Uh, satellite dish, wall, window, hanging basket, yikes, garage door, basement, driveway, stairs, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, when you guys have time later, Please look at that in more detail, but I think I'm going to stop here for right now because that's kind of a load of vocabulary and I'm going to erase the board. So 
our plan in the third day or the third class today, guys. Uh, Mondays are always kind of boring, but what we'll do in the third class is we are going to talk about your writing assignment for this week and what is required for it. We will go over, we actually have a written example, but I will also try to provide you guys with another example on the board. And of course, we're going to have to try to use some of the vocabulary or idioms that we have. And we're going to have to try to keep in mind OSES comp, right? O-S-A-S-C-O-M-P. And we'll see how it goes. Anyhow, uh, Gian and Alejandro, I'm so sorry that, like, uh, when we started our first class, I know you guys couldn't hear me, but also I couldn't see your comments. So yeah, good morning to Alejandro and Gian and anybody else watching. I hope you guys are doing well, whether you guys are in Canada or you are still in Colombia, Korea, or Japan, or whatever. And I hope you guys had a good weekend. Um, I, I'm trying to think, what did I do on the weekend? Um, every weekend or every day is almost a blur to me because I don't get enough sleep. Um, ah, well, actually, it was my nephew's birthday last Saturday. He turned nine. So I had to go to his birthday party. It was pretty good. Had some pizza and a cake. And I gave him a present, so that was fun. And I went with my older daughter. And she had a lot of fun, so I was happy about that. But other than that, it was a pretty boring weekend for me. Kind of stressful, actually, going to the birthday party. Because after, I had so many other things to do. And my kids were kind of grumpy that day. But yesterday was a much nicer day. Just went on a couple of walks. Didn't really do anything uh, special, but yeah, went on a walk, had a pretty good time, and my kids were well behaved, so I was happy for that. Anyhow, guys, yeah, let's take a 10 minute break, and when we get back, let's get into that assignment. All right, I will see you guys again in about 10 minutes.
Okay guys, welcome back to Live PST. We are now in our third class on Monday. All right guys, now like I said before, in our third class here, we're going to be talking about your writing assignment and I'm going to be providing you guys with a model in addition to an example that you guys also have if you take a look there. So anyhow guys, please take a look at this sheet here, Global College Assignment, where the heart is. Now actually, I didn't really take a good look at this in detail before I was talking about it earlier today. I thought you guys were going to be writing about your home in your home country, but actually this is a little bit more interesting. So let's take a look here. It says, this week your assignment is to describe your dream house. Consider the following aspects. One, what kind of house do you want? Do you want an apartment? Do you want a condo? A mansion, a villa, a trailer, what kind of house do you want? Two, where do you want it to be located? Do you want it to be located downtown in a large city? The beachfront, right next to the beach? On a mountainside, on the side of a mountain? Or somewhere in the countryside or in the suburbs? Like where do you want this house to be? Like in what country maybe? What kind of climate? What city? Etc. Then after that, does it have any special rooms? Does it have a pool room, a sauna, a game room, a home theater? How many rooms would be in your dream house, right? What kind of rooms would you have there? What things might be in each room, right? So that's where you're going to use a lot of the vocabulary that we looked at earlier. <clears throat> and does it have any special features? Um, like the front or backyard, does it have a porch, a balcony, does it have a pond, sports court, maybe you've got a tennis court on your new dream house or a pool or something like that, right? Okay, so remember, this is your dream house, so be as extravagant as you want, right? Money is not a concern here. This is your dream home, right? Hooray! You don't have to worry about money. You can have whatever you want here. Now, the grammar theme of the week is adjective order or order of adjectives. So, be sure to use lots of them to enrich your writing, to make your writing look nicer, right? You should write four to five paragraphs and include a minimum of five of the vocabulary or idioms or expressions that you learnt today on Monday, right? So just using five of those terms is really, really easy. I'd also push you guys, try to use the order of adjectives also at five different points throughout your writing, right? Try to think of multiple adjectives and then put them into the correct order using OSES comp, right? Anyhow, Please remember to also use transitional phrases of agreement and contrast to make your writing flow more smoothly. Now, what I'm talking about here is something that we've talked in about a lot of weeks prior to this. You guys should be able also to find this sheet here. Um, and it says linking words, a complete list of transition words and conjunctions also called, well, I can't read the title here because it's kind of cut off, Connesive Devices, Connecting Words, right? Transition words and phrases. There's a lot of useful phrases here. My recommendation, like usual, is to write a five paragraph paper and try to use things like, you know, in your body paragraphs, firstly, secondly, thirdly. So you're going to start with your intro, then you're going to have body paragraph one, two, three, and your conclusion, right? Now, of course, your writing, as usual, is due on Wednesday, right? So before class starts on Wednesday, try to submit your writing. You've got this afternoon and evening, and you have tomorrow, right, to work on this in order to submit it for Friday. Um, so try your best. Anyhow, the terms here that you could also use are things like likewise, in addition, furthermore, however, although, despite that, Etc. 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 So, what we're going to do first, guys, before I provide you guys with my own model, let's take a look at what somebody else has written here. We have my dream house writing sample. 
And so please take a look at this sheet here. Let's read over it and see what this person or how this person imagines their dream house would be like. So this guy says here, since I was a child, I had been dreaming to live in a house that would be a place of peace, joy, and inspiration. I don't like the idea of living in a noisy city in an apartment in a block of flats. My dream house should be situa situated outside the city in a deserted place, somewhere in a wood near a lake surrounded by the wild, beautiful nature, or it would be an amazing idea to live somewhere on an island like Hawaii with beautiful sandy beaches and a lot of sun. First and foremost, my dream house should be of a simple design. I would like it to be a bungalow style house designed in basic colors that are appealing to the eyes. I would like to have a huge lawn in the front of my house and enough parking for several cars. There should be a small garden planted with fruit trees, bushes and flowers. I prefer to spend a lot of time out of doors, so an attractive outer design is very important for me. In addition, my dream house should be large and spacious with plenty of large windows that would make the rooms bright and airy. The interior design of my house should be carefully planned in every detail, but I should confess that I prefer a minimalistic approach. So I don't like my ideal house to be stuffed with a lot of unnecessary furniture. I would like to have a spacious hall and a large living room with comfortable sofas and armchairs and a large soft carpet on the floor. My kitchen should be equipped with the latest cooking appliances and utensils. I would like to have a really huge refrigerator that could be filled with cool drinks and a freezer. My kitchen should be designed in a Scandinavian style hmm, with simple white walls and a floor. I would like to have a large wooden dining table. I would also like to have three bedrooms with attached bathrooms with a state-of-the-art shower and a jacuzzi. Wow, luxurious. The bedrooms should be cozy with large beds and soft carpets on the floors. I would like to have a large TV set in my bedroom and a built-in closet. I am fond of reading, so I would like to have shelves with books of my favorite writers that would line the walls from the floor to the ceiling. In the library, I prefer to have the latest desktop computer to surf the internet. To put it simply, I would like to have a warm and welcoming home. Wow. Okay, so I like this person's idea of their dream house. Sounds pretty cool. Now, the way I would organize this five paragraph written assignment though, is different from the way this person did. This is a good example, right? And you can get a lot of like interesting vocabulary out of this. But my recommendation here guys, as usual, is five paragraph style. Your introduction, body paragraph one, two, three, and your conclusion. Now, the way I would order the body paragraphs would be like this. Now, if you take a look at the assignment sheet again, you have those four different points that they want you to address. In the first body paragraph, I would address the first two points. What kind of house do you want? So that should be the first point. But also in the first body paragraph, I think you want to talk about where you would like your house to, your dream house to be located, right? Is it in the city? Is it in Canada? Is it in America? Is it in Mexico? Where is it? That kind of stuff. Second body paragraph, this is where I think you should talk about the rooms in the house and maybe what they would contain, right? Your third body paragraph, I think that's where you want to talk about like kind of special things about the house. Like maybe you're going to have a pool or a big backyard or you're going to have, you know, all these kind of crazy things, right? And then your conclusion. All right, guys. So let me think of my own model here. So the title that I would use for this would be something simple. My dream house. 
Okay, now sometimes in your introductory paragraph, you want to start by just talking about the topic in general, and then maybe you want to explain how you're going to organize your paper, right? But anyhow, my dream house. Yeah, ever since. Mine is going to start a little bit similar to the written example that you guys but have, but ever since I was a little kid, I have often dreamt of having a really awesome house. I would like to write about my dream house today. I will write about where it will be. the rooms and special features. Let's get started. Okay guys, like normal, a introduction or introductory paragraph is generally pretty short. Now what I've done here is just briefly talked about the topic. You know, ever since I was a little kid, I've often dreamt of having a really awesome house, right? Like lots of kids, right? The second sentence here in my introduction, I'm kind of showing the plan of how I'm going to organize my writing. I would like to write about my dream house today. I will write about where it will be, the rooms and special features. So first paragraph, where it will be, second paragraph, the rooms, and third paragraph, special features. Let's get started. Okay guys, so introduction should be relatively short, right? Maybe a short little plan of what you're going to do and just talk about the topic in general. But don't go into any detail. That's for your body paragraph. So let me erase this here and let's get into body paragraph one where we will be addressing two out of the four points here. And I will actually have to think about this because well, I don't often think about this. Now, remember though, we also need to use OSES comp and we also need to try to use some idioms or vocabulary that we looked at today, right? Now, the two things that we want to deal with in body paragraph number one is we want to deal with what kind of house I want to have, whether that's an apartment, a condo, or whatever. And we also want to deal with where it will be located. Hmm. Okay, so let's start. My dream house would be a large cottage like mansion. on a mountain side, hopefully next to a river. Okay, so I've talked about in general where, what kind of house it would be and where it would basically be located, right? A dream house would be a large cottage-like mansion. Now, when I say cottage-like mansion, I mean like the house should look like a cottage. And a cottage is usually made out of wood, right? And located like in a forest or something like that. Be a large cotton-like mansion. So it'd be a mansion, but it would look like a cottage 
on a mountainside. So it's going to be on the side of a mountain, hopefully next to a river. Oh, and I'm going to add one more thing here. Hopefully next to a river and surrounded by a forest. So I'm gonna also going to include here, obviously, it would be located outside of a city. So yeah, obviously, like if I'm living in a forested area on the side of a mountain next to a river, it's not going to be in a city, right? So I'm probably living in, you know, outside of a city, maybe kind of a rural area, something like that, right? Now, I also need to talk more about where I want it to be located in a bit more detail. Like, um, is it in Canada? Where is it? Hmm. Ideally, it would be in British Columbia, but I'm going to be lazy here, BC, Canada. But if it were not, I would like it to be in Scandinavia, like Norway, whoops, Sweden, or Finland. Now, so I want my mansion, my cottage-like mansion, to be on the side of a mountain, in a forest, with a river, but I also want it to be most likely in Canada, and if not in Canada, maybe somewhere else in a northern country like Sweden, Finland, or Norway. Not Russia though, Russia is a little bit scary. Just kidding if you're from Russia. Uh, now, I'm going to write here the reason why is because I hate hot weather. So I would prefer to live in a cold northern country. And hopefully my wife and children would too, because they'd, yeah, if I can't live with them, that would not work out. Anyhow guys, but I'm done my first body paragraph. So I've talked about what I would like to live in, basically a cottage-like mansion and where it would be located. So let's think about this again. Um, now, uh, one problem here is I haven't really used OSIS comp or any of the vocab or idiom so far. So I'm gonna have to try to keep that in mind when I'm writing the second body paragraph and the third body paragraph. But thinking about this again, my dream house would be a large cotton-like mansion on a mountainside, hopefully next to a river and surrounded by a forest. Obviously, it would be located outside of a city. Ideally, it would be in British Columbia, Canada, but if it were not, I would like it to be in Scandinavia, like Norway, Sweden, or Finland. The reason why is because I hate hot weather, so I would prefer to live in a cold northern country. Okay, so that's just me guys. All right, so I got body paragraph one. Let's move on to body paragraph two. Now body paragraph two, we need to talk about the rooms in the house. Like how many rooms are you going to have? What's going to be in these rooms? This kind of stuff. And when you're talking about what's going to be in those rooms, that's when you're going to want to rely on those lists of vocabulary, right? So we'll erase this here and we will move on. Da, 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 da. Okay. Da. Okay, so I'm gonna be lazy here. I'm gonna write BP2, body paragraph two. All right guys, so we're talking about 
the rooms in the house, right? So, I'm going to start with secondly. Okay, secondly, my dream home or house would have, now I need to think, let's start with bedrooms, right? How many bedrooms would I want? Four. Would have four bedrooms. Just in case I have two more kids. So in case I have, wait, 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 one more kid. Bleh. Not two more. Just in case I have one more child. So I already got two, so you know, there's room for my wife and I, and then one each for the other one. Now, also, like the person who wrote here, I think it'd be really awesome if each room had its own bathroom, right? Each room, or each bedroom, should have a separate bathroom attached to it, right? And, oh, I should talk about the flooring. The flooring throughout the house should be a beautiful Mmm, beautiful brown Danish wooden Now that sounds kind of weird. Actually, I'm going to change the sentence, guys, just because I'm trying to use OSAS here, right? Um, let's say this. And start with throughout. Throughout the house or home, there should be beautiful brown Danish wooden flooring. Okay, now this is where I'm using OSS comp, right? I'm describing the floor. We've got four adjectives here, right? We've got beautiful, we've got brown, we've got Danish, we've got wooden. Now, is the order of adjectives here correct? Let's think about it. OSAS comp, right? Opinion, size, and then what else do we have, right? Opinion, size, age, shape, color, origin, material, purpose, right? Anyhow, beautiful is an opinion, so that is correct. Brown is a color which comes fifth, so this might be correct. So we got one, five, then Danish would be the origin, which is six, and then wooden would be the material, which is seven. So actually, yes, I am right. Hooray, good for me, right? So I've used OSAS comp, right? But also, um, I want to use some of the vocabulary. So the vocabulary here is so extensive. Um, I don't know, there, there's so much vocab. And I'm going to write here each and every room should have an air conditioner and heater. There should be two well equipped kitchens. Should be two well equipped kitchens. One for my family and another for guests. 
All right. And the living room. Yeah, everybody wants to talk about the living room, right? The living room should be large with multiple comfortable sofas, a large screen TV, and a fireplace. In addition to that, I want a bear rug. Okay, now that might sound kind of weird, but anyhow. Um, okay, I think I wrote too much. Body paragraph two could be really, really large, right? Because you're talking about like the houses or like the rooms in the house, what they might contain, right? So this could be most likely your biggest paragraph. Honestly, I could write a lot more here, but eh, it's not really useful at this point. But let, let's think about what I've written so far for body paragraph two. Secondly, my dream home would have four bedrooms just in case I have one more child, right? Because I already got two. Um, each bedroom should have a separate bathroom attached to it, right? Throughout the house, there should be beautiful brown Danish wooden flooring, right? So I used OSIS comp at least one time. Each and every room should have an air conditioner and heater. So everybody can control their own environments in each room, right? There should be two well-equipped kitchens, one for my family and another for guests. So just in case guests come over, they can use their own separate kitchen. That'd be pretty awesome. Uh, the living room should be large with multiple comfortable sofas, a large screen TV, and a fireplace. Because having a fireplace in a living room is just really, really awesome. And if this dream house of mine is located on the side of a mountain in a northern country, it's going to get cold. So sometimes you want to have a real fire, right? In addition to that, I want a bear rug. Uh, <laughs> so I think you guys know what a rug is. Rug is kind of like a separated carpet, right? Um, when I was a little kid, uh, one of my good friends, his dad was a hunter. And at the time in my hometown, it was legal to hunt and kill bears, which is, sounds kind of bad, but anyhow. Uh, but he was a good guy. He would use, you know, if he did hunt something, he would use the entire animal. And he made a bear rug one time and they put it in the middle of their living room and it was so nice and soft. It was like really super awesome. It was so nice. So anyhow, yeah, if I had a house on the side of a mountain and it was a nice little mansion, whatever, yeah, I'd like a bear rug too. Now I could continue onwards here. There's so much more stuff I could write, but I'm going to stop it there for body paragraph two and I'm going to move into body paragraph three. Now body paragraph three this is where you want to talk about extra special features. I kind of touched on special features anyhow, but maybe I'm going to talk about special things in the house or outside of the house, right? Do, 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 do. Erase this here. And remember, you can write as extravagantly as you want, right? Money is not a concern, obviously, because this house would already cost, I don't know, tens of millions of dollars. Anyhow, body paragraph three. Mm. Thirdly, there would be a number of special features. So I'm kind of introducing in the first sentence what I'm going to be talking about in this paragraph. Surrounding my house, there would be a moat. 
which is basically a small river. There would be a moat and you would have to go over a small bridge to get to the front door. Okay, so I want, that's kind of silly. Uh, but yeah, you have to imagine this in your head, right? So surrounding my house, there's going to be a small moat. And moat is not a common word. Moat is a word that describes like kind of a small river surrounding usually a castle in Europe. And of course, this would be used as a defensive measure against invading armies. But anyhow, yeah, I would like to have a moat uh, around the house. And in order to get to the front door, you'd have to use a bridge, right? So there would be a bridge going to the front door. Also, I should have mentioned here that at any point I can press a button and the bridge will go up. So if we don't want somebody coming in, and maybe there's an uninvited guest like a bear because of course they're living in the mountains or a mountain lion or a cougar or a wolverine or something like that, I could use that, right? Um, it would have both a large front yard and backyard. The backyard would have a pond with fish and there would be a, okay, a large circular, hmm, large circular American style wooden gazebo. Okay. Now, actually, this is good because I wanted to use OSAS comp again. Now, I said before, try to use OSAS comp at five different points throughout your writing. Honestly, it's kind of hard to use OSAS comp at so many points in your writing. At least try to use it two or three times. Anyhow, so I got another example here, though. There would be a large, circular, American-style wooden gazebo. So gazebo is our noun. Now a gazebo, uh, don't worry about the word gazebo so much, but a gazebo is usually like an outside, okay, I'm not very good at drawing. I'll try to draw an example of a gazebo really quick. It's an outside place where people have like a picnic or a barbecue. It usually kind of looks like this and maybe there are stairs and you know there are people in here. This is not a jail. I know my drawings are very bad. But anyhow, a gazebo is yeah, sometimes rich people have them, or um, they can be found in a city in certain places. Uh, Vancouver has quite a few gazebos. Anyhow, but I would have a large, circular, American-style wooden gazebo. Now, again, is this correct? Did I use OSIS comp correctly? Let's think about this, right? So large is talking about size, OSAS, so that's number two. Circular is talking about the shape. O-S-A-S. -S. Now, second S is side. Fourth S is shape. So, for American style. American is talking about the origin, right? So, let's think about it. O-S-A-S-C-O. -S so, six is talking about the origin. And again, wooden is the material. So, it's seven. Okay, good. So, I did use OSIS comp correctly, right? Large, circular, American-style, wooden gazebo, right? Anyhow, so what am I saying here? Let, let's get back to this, the actual writing. So in my backyard, the backyard would have a pond with fish, and there would be a large, circular, American-style, wooden gazebo. Um, the gazebo 
would come with a large barbecue so that I could entertain guests and family members. So just in case like my mom, brother, sister, whatever came, we could go to the gazebo and have a big barbecue and have a good time. Okay, so I got a pond, I've got a boat, I've got a gazebo. Um, other special features I would like to have. Huh, I don't know, I'm not really a greedy guy. Um, but yeah, the backyard. should be attached to some hiking trails because I like nature. So I'm originally from a small town in northern British Columbia where you know, lots of mountains, surrounded by forests, um, this kind of stuff. Um, so I really do like, I'm not really an outdoors kind of guy, but I do like things like fishing and hiking and hunting to a lesser degree. But yeah, I would really like to have some hiking trails kind of connected to the house so I could go on daily hikes. I think that'd be really, really nice. Um, of course, I would also have a enormous garage where I would store my cars, trucks, fishing, equipment, etc. right? So if I did have this large house, yeah, I'd also want a large garage, and in that garage, you know, I could keep cars, fishing equipment, etc. right? Anyhow, guys, with this paragraph here, again, I could write in a lot more detail and include a lot more stuff here, right? Any kind of special feature. Maybe in the front yard, there's also a helicopter landing pad so that my business executive friends could fly their helicopter in and I could hang out with Elon Musk and do all this cool stuff. You know, whatever. <laughs> or Bill Gates could come and hang out and we could have a barbecue. Um, yeah, but yeah, I could have included many more things here. You know, maybe special things about other rooms in the house, like there would be a slide from one room to another. Ah! I should have included this. Actually, I'm going to write this down. I would like the house. I would like the house to have a traditional Canadian style. So, traditional Canadian style is kind of like a lot of wood, a um, lot of wood, kind of warm feeling, Canadian style, mixed with the Japanese idea of, there's this Japanese idea called wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi is kind of a minimalistic plus comfortable approach to organizing a house. Now, that does sound kind of crazy because I've talked about all these crazy features and all of a sudden I'm like, hey, I want to have a wabi-sabi lifestyle where everything's comfortable, but whatever. Anyhow, guys, so ugh, that's way too much stuff, but that's good. Okay, so we're done. The third body paragraph, last but not least, comes the conclusion. Dun, 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 dun. So let me erase this here.
Okay, so conclusions are generally kind of short like um, introductions are, right? So you don't have to write a really large extensive conclusion. But your conclusion here, uh, now a lot of ways, and this is kind of a boring way to start a conclusion, but you can always start with, in my conclusion, I think my dream house would cost around probably $50 million <laughs> um, if it's around Vancouver. $50 million. That's a lot of money. So if I really want to live in my dream house, I either better get lucky and win the lottery or <laughs> or work really hard and I don't know uh, start a profitable company, but actually should probably say a very, very profitable company, right? Anyhow, um, my dream house may be unrealistic. But, hmm, but it would be fantastic if I could live there. Okay guys, so I kept the conclusion relatively short. I think I just mentioned like trying to bring it back to reality really, like this is really unrealistic like having this place. but. Uh, in my conclusion, I think my ho dream house would cost around $50 million. That's a lot of money, so if I really want to live in my dream house, I either better get lucky and win the lottery or work really, really hard. Even if I won the lottery, you know, $50 million, ugh, that's really expensive, right? Uh, better work really hard and start a profitable company. A dream house may be unrealistic, but it would be fantastic if I could live there. All right, guys. Now. Um, another thing I wasn't really paying attention to was how often I was using the vocabulary from the sheets, but I do think I used enough of them to cover the five terms, right? And I did use OSES comp twice. So let me look at the rules here again uh, for this here. Mm. Da, 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 da. Ah, okay, so there wasn't a rule about how often you have to use the grammar rule here. The grammar theme of the week is adjective order, so to be sure to use lots of them to enrich your writing. You should write four to five paragraphs and include at least a minimum of five of the vocabulary or idioms. I didn't use any of the idioms. I didn't really keep that in mind. I think I at least used five of the different terms that are mentioned on the vocabulary sheets, which are very extensive. Um, now, it doesn't say how often you should use OSAS comp. But I just used it twice, so try your best. If you could use it two or more times, I think that's good enough. And when you're using it, try to use it with, you know, when you're describing something with more than three or more adjectives, right? And make sure you follow the rules. OSAS comp. So opinion, size, age, and then shape, and then C, O, M, P, right? Color, origin, material, purpose. Um, so try your best with that, but focus maybe more on the vocabulary and just have fun with this, right? This is your dream house. 
It can be located anywhere in any country and include anything you want, right? If you want to have something crazy like me and have a moat with a gazebo and a barbecue and all this crazy stuff, go right ahead. Another thing I should keep in mind, guys, is if I were actually writing this myself, each body paragraph would be quite a lot longer than what I wrote down here, um, especially body paragraph two and body paragraph three. I felt like for me, both of them were incomplete. I could have written a lot more about all the other rooms in the house. I didn't really talk about like the bathrooms in any detail or what the kitchen or living room. I did talk about them, but not in very much detail. So I think you guys, when you're writing about that, try to write in more detail than I did. And in body paragraph three, when you talk about special features as well, try to write in more detail than I did because I was just running out of room basically, right? But yeah, that's about it. That is your assignment for this week, Wednesday. But throughout this week, you're gonna be talking more about home and houses and where you would like to live. So keep OSES comp in mind and with the vocabulary, take a look at it and make sure you kind of study it so you know how to refer to those things, right? And yeah, so for the rest of the week on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, of course, you guys are gonna be with Melanie, but you guys will see me again on Friday when we go over the grammar review, vocab review, and talk about your quiz and that kind of stuff, right? So that's our basic plan for this week. You know, but maybe if your dream house is similar to the house you already live in with your parents, um, yeah, maybe, maybe you don't have a hard time writing or you won't have a hard time writing this assignment. We'll see what happens, right? And of course, yeah, it's your dream house, so it could be a castle or, I don't know, it could look like a church or a shrine or whatever you want it to look like, right? Um, so have a lot of fun with this assignment go crazy, write about anything you really want to. It's really, really okay. Um, anyhow, guys, uh, what else could I tell you about right now? I think that's about it for me right now, but um, I hope you guys have a good day, of course. Maybe you guys have big plans, and I don't really have big plans. I need to catch up on some work, so that should be a lot of fun. And I have to do some grocery shopping later today. Wow. So, got to go get some pasta sauce and spaghetti noodles and some protein and, you know, stuff like that. That should be extremely exciting, right? <laughs> but maybe you guys have a similar mundane plan in mind, right? Well, before we finish the class, of course, I should erase the board here as well. Dun, 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 dun. And anyhow, yeah, and I kind of wonder how the coronavirus situation is in your country. Uh, Alejandro and Colombia, I hope things aren't so bad. I actually haven't really heard anything good or bad about the coronavirus situation in Colombia. So I'm guessing it's not terrible. Um, you know, as you may or may not know, the situation in Canada is not really that bad. It's not great, but it's not that bad. I know, Gian, in Korea that you guys are actually doing a really good job of containing and fighting the virus. So good for you guys in Korea. I think Korea is a pretty safe place to be right now as far as the coronavirus is concerned. Canada is doing pretty good, especially compared to the United States. The United States, I don't know what's going on there. They have the ability, they have the money to deal with coronavirus, but I think culturally American people are more than Canadians, there's, you know, this coronavirus does show a huge difference between Canadian and American people. Basically, Canadian people will listen to their government and they will follow a lot of basic rules. Some people will break the rules and be stupid, but most Canadians will follow the rules and that's why coronavirus is not too bad here. But in the United States, even though they are rich and even though they have good infrastructure and a good they have good doctors, right? The medical system there, yeah, but they have good doctors. But the main problem in the United States is they are just too individualistic. They don't listen to the government, and that's why I think it's so bad down there. But anyhow, I will see you guys again on Friday. Have fun with Melanie Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. All right, guys, see you later.